So there was a recent TED Talk that actually talked about AI agents, and it was a very fascinating TED Talk presented by the senior research scientist at NVIDIA and the lead of AI agents initiative. So this is Jim Fan, the senior research scientist at NVIDIA AI, and in this fascinating talk, he gives us a breakdown of where the future is headed with AI agents. He talks about something called the foundation agent, which would essentially seamlessly operate across both the virtual and physical world. And he explains how this technology could fundamentally change our lives, permeating everything from video games and metaverse to drones and humanoid robots, and explores how a single model could master these skills across different realities. Now, this foundation agent is not to be confused with AGI itself, because AGI refers to a level of artificial intelligence where a machine can understand, learn, and apply its intelligence to solve any problem in a manner comparable to a human across a wide range of domains. Now, now this idea of the foundation agent seems to be about creating a versatile, multifunctional AI that can operate both in virtual and physical environments, mastering skills in various realities. Now, now in this video, I was lucky enough to be part of a private discussion with Jim Fan himself, where he discussed the real future of foundation agents and discussed some of the research papers that he worked on, which are going to help to contribute towards the development of the future research and development of the foundation agents and the industry as a whole. So I'm going to show you guys just a few seconds from his TED talk, because it is one that shouldn't be missed at all, especially if you want to stay up to date on where everything is headed in AI. And then I'll share with you guys the conversation that we had about AI agents and some of the papers that Jim Fan worked on himself. As we progress through this map, we will eventually get to the upper right corner, which is a single agent that generalizes across all three axes. And that is the foundation agent. I believe training foundation agent will be very similar to ChatGPT. All language tasks can be expressed as text in and text out, be it writing poetry, translating English to Spanish, or coding Python, it's all the same. And ChatGPT simply scales this up massively across lots and lots of data. It's the same principle. The foundation agent takes as input an embodiment prompt and a task prompt and output actions. And we train it by simply scaling it up massively across lots and lots of realities. Um, yes, so the first work I want to cover is Voyager. Um, and uh, Voyager was uh, one of the first, was the first LLM powered AI agent that can play Minecraft professionally. Um, so um, I, I suppose most of you are familiar with Minecraft. Um, it's got like 140 million active players. That's more than twice the population of UK. So it's kind of insanely popular and beloved game. Um, and it's open-ended, doesn't have a fixed storyline. You can do whatever your heart desires in the game. So we want an AI to have the same capabilities. And when we set Voyager loose in Minecraft, um, it's able to play the game for hours on end without any human intervention. So the video here um, actually shows snippets from a single episode of Voyager. This is just a single run that lasted for like four to five hours. And we took some of the segments out and made, made this montage. Um, so you see that Voyager explores the terrains, mine all kinds of materials, fight monsters, craft hundreds of recipes, and it's able to unlock an ever expanding tree of skills. What is the magic behind it? Right? The key insight is coding as action. Um, you know, Minecraft is a, is a 3D world, but our most powerful LLMs, at least at the time of Voyager's writing, uh, was GPT-4 and it was text only. So we need a way to convert the 3D world into a textual re representation. Um, and thanks to the very enthusiastic Minecraft com uh, community, uh, we actually have an open source JavaScript API that we can use. It's called MindFlayer. Um, so we use this code API, and then uh, Voyager is an algorithm designed on top of GPT-4. So the way it does it is to invoke GPT-4 to generate a code snippet in JavaScript, and each snippet is an executable skill in the game. Um, and then uh, once it writes the code, it will be run uh, in the actual game runtime. And just like human engineers, the program that Voyager writes isn't always correct. 
So we have a self-reflection mechanism to help it improve. And more specifically, there are three different sources of self-reflection. Um, one is JavaScript execution error, where you know the agent's current state like um, hunger, health, and inventory, or the world state like landscape, resources, enemies nearby, are fed to Voyager um, from, 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 the, from, from the agent state. Um, and then given the state, um, the agent will take an action and then observe the consequence of the action on the world and on itself, reflect on how it could do better, try out more actions and rinse and repeat. And once a skill becomes mature, uh, Voyager stores the program into a skill library so that it can quickly recall in the future. You can think of it as a code base authored entirely by GPT-4. And in this way, Voyager is able to bootstrap its own capabilities recursively as it explores and experiments in Minecraft, right? Because now we're talking about coding and coding is compositional. Um, Voyager can write a bunch of functions and in the future, uh, the future functions can compose some of the older functions in more and more complex skills and programs. All right, so let's go through a working example together. Like the agent in Minecraft finds its hunger bar dropping to one out of 20. So it knows it needs to find food. And now it senses four entities nearby, a cat, a villager, a pig, and some wheat seed. So now it starts an inner monologue, right? Do I kill the cat? or the villager for food, that sounds like a bad idea. How about the wheat seed? I could grow a farm, but it's gonna take a very long time. So, you know, sorry, Piggy, you are the chosen one. And then Voyager checks the inventory, uh, retrieves an old skill from the library to craft an iron sword, and then starts to learn a new skill called Hunt Pig. Um, so that's kind of a working example of how Voyager would go through this loop. And the question still re remains, how does Voyager keep exploring indefinitely? So all we did, is to give Voyager a high-level directive, obtain as many unique items as possible. And then Voyager implements a curriculum, again by itself, to find progressively harder and novel challenges to solve. So um, I want to highlight that none of these are hard-coded. This progression of skills are discovered by Voyager itself as it explores. And also the, the, the curriculum that Voyager proposes is conditioned on its current capabilities, right? Like if, if you only know how to use wooden tools, then you probably shouldn't propose to solve some diamond, uh, to solve some tasks that would require diamond tools, right? There is like a progression of it. And Voyager is able to find this curriculum automatically. And putting all these together, uh, Voyager is able to not only master, but also discover new skills along the way. And we didn't pre-program any of these. It's all Voyager's idea. We simply took uh, some snapshots from uh, its um, you know, playing session. And uh, that's what, is shown here. And we call this process lifelong learning, where the agent is forever curious and also forever pursuing new adventures. Uh, have you guys considered putting more than one agent in the same server together and seeing if they can learn to interact with each other and complete tasks uh, cooperatively? That's a great idea. So we thought about it, but um, back then, um, like the, the well, I, I think that the framework doesn't really support multi-agent, at least, you know, the, the, the framework we implemented does not quite support that, but it is on our kind of a future. So yeah, yeah, it, it is a very interesting question. Uh, and I do think having multi-agent would have new emergent properties. Right. Yeah. Cause my, my whole thought process was like long-term we could see, you know, maybe we could have 30 plus agents all in a world building villages together <coughs> and stuff like that. We could really see how they could develop different, uh, maybe ideals or goals over time that, and see what kind of separates them. Mm -hmm. I, I just thought that was interesting. Thanks for answering. It, it is it is very interesting. Yeah, yeah, um, it's such a great idea. For, uh, I remember in your TED talk, you mentioned that how foundation agent is the way to go from what I understand, yeah. Voyager is very successful thanks to Mind Dojo. So how are you and other NVIDIA researchers going to overcome the data set curation barrier and able to have like, foundation agent to be able to play on one ten thousands other simulated realities in maybe Terraria, per se? Yes. So um, I, I think there are a couple of dimensions here. Um, like in, in my TED talk, I talk about three axes. So um, the, the first axis is skills, the, the number of skills the agent can master. And the second one is the number of embodiment that it can control. And by embodiment, uh, I mean um, things like robot bodies. Um, so you, you can have, uh, you know, a humanoid form factor, or you can have uh, like a um, like a robot dog, 
or you know agents in Minecraft, right? You have kind of different ways, like different bodies that you can control. So that's what we call embodiment. Um, and the third axis is um, realities, basically the number of simulations that the, the agent can master. And here um, for Voyager, we only tried it in Minecraft because it is an open-ended world. It is like one simulation, but it's kind of like a meta simulation, right? Like in, in this one simulation, you can do so many different things. In fact, infinitely, uh, infinite number of creative things. And we have seen humans doing crazy things in this world as well. Like someone actually built a functioning CPU circuit within Minecraft because Minecraft supports something called a redstone circuit, uh, which apparently makes the game Turing complete. It's like a programmable game. Um, and Minecraft is just one uh, kind of simulated reality, um, but also there are thousands of games out there, right? There's Legend of Zelda, there's Elden Ring, right? All of the open-ended games. And there are also simulated uh, realities for robots. And we also have the real world, which is by itself, right? Our OG reality. So the way I, I see kind of the future of foundation models for agent is that we need to scale across all the three axes I just talked about. We, we need to scale over the number of skills, uh, embodiments you can control. A single model can control all the robot bodies. And then it can master all kinds of different rules, mechanics, uh, and physics in different worlds, virtual and physical worlds alike. And here, the, 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 the idea is if a model is able to master, let's say, a hundred different simulated realities, then our real physical world could simply be the 100,001st reality. So some of you might heard about something called the simulation hypothesis, right? Like saying that, oh, our real world is actually a simulation. Um, I mean, we can talk about metaphysics and philosophy all day, but I actually think that idea is great to build AI because for AI, our real world is just another simulation to it. Like we can actually use this principle to guide the design of our next generation of embodied AI systems. And that is kind of a quick recap of the main idea called Foundation Agent in my TED Talk. Yeah, th th does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I, I was more curious about how it's going, because data is probably going to be a key, and how how yeah. it's going to learn skills is depending on, like, uh, I remember um, Mind Dojo, or I forgot which one, is relying on YouTube uh, to learn all the Minecraft yes. movements or my Minecraft skills. Um, so is it basically had to rely on all um, pre-existing data or like the the whole data creation problem or will you, will you have like agent to simulate or like naturally learn skills by itself in the future? Yes, let me uh, switch to the Mind Dojo slide and let me reshare it. So I, I, I think you're right, right? We, we need some data to bootstrap the process. Um, and for Minecraft um, specifically, right? Like this game is one of the most, maybe the most streamed games on YouTube. So there are like hundreds or if not millions of hours of Minecraft play videos online. And in MindDojo, we explored this uh, process. We, we ex explored this data set. So uh, we collected a lot of YouTube videos uh, where you know both kind of the gamer is playing the game and also narrating what they're doing. And, and these are like uh, real segments from a tutorial video. Right, uh, let's say video clip three. As I raise my axe in front of this pig, there's only one thing you know is going to happen. This is uh, actually uh, some YouTuber said this, and, and we uh, put it in a data set. So the way we use this model is uh, we, we train something called Mind Club. And to skip the technical details, what the model does is that it learns the association between the video and the transcript that describes the actions in the video. So let's say for this example, um, you know, this transcript, I'm going to go around gathering a little bit more wood from these trees. This transcript aligns very well with the activity in this video. So this score will be close to one. And, and this part is talking about pig. It's not aligned with this video. And the score will be close to zero. So the score will always be between zero and one. And one means perfect description. Zero means the text is irrelevant. And you can treat this as a reward function. So concretely, how you would use it is you have an agent simulation. And then um, you have a task prompt asking it to share sheep to obtain wool. And as the agent explores, it will generate a video snippet, right? And then this video snippet can be compared to this language embedding and then output a score. And you want to maximize this score because that means your behavior is aligned with what the task prompt wants you to do. And this becomes a reinforcement learning loop. So it's actually ROI track if you look at it, if you squeeze at it. It's ROI track, right? Learning reinforcement learning from human feedback, 
in Minecraft. And just that the human feedback is not learned by annotating the data set manually, but from kind of uh, getting the transcript and videos from YouTube. Um, so that's how um, in the Mind Dojo paper, we're able to leverage this YouTube uh, video data set. And, and, and moving forward, there are also other ways that we can use the video, right? So um, I, I, I kind of briefly mentioned like a few things in the slides as well. Um, like for example, um, you can you can learn you, you can learn like encoding. You can learn encoding of um, the visual representations from the video. This work uh, is uh, applied in robotics, but it can also be used for things like Minecraft. And you can also even directly learn some behaviors from video by pseudo labeling the actions. So there are many ways kind of on how to use the videos to bootstrap embodied agents. And MindDojo is a, a very particular way to do it. So that Jim, Daniel, I know you have a question. Like the action space was, um, human annotated from different youtube clips i think you guys set up a like a label studio set up and was like labeling this is mining something this is doing xyz but in voyager those actions were extracted by gpt4 um and then saved in a database so my question is did you notice any actions that were found by the ai kind of like AlphaGo, um, one of your recent tweets where it found moves that a human wouldn't do it stored moves that a human wouldn't do and uh, like i guess this is sort of an aside because i'm now realizing that the the video data was all human actions so i'm guessing um that might not be the case yeah so uh a, a, a few things um to note one is um, in Mind Dojo, um, the, the the labeling part is about curating a set of tasks that uh, could be possible in Minecraft, mm -hmm. and we curated that set of tasks from some YouTube videos. Um, but those are not the actions and are not used to train the model. So we only mm -hmm. train the model using kind of transcripts from in the wild, and the, the the manual curation is only for kind of these are the interesting tasks that can be done. But we did not use that as actions, um, mm -hmm. and. For Voyager, uh, coming back to your question, um, so it's it's able to kind of learn all these skills like necessary to survive and to basically find new objects because we gave it, uh, yeah, let me kind of, um, this one. Um, so we, we, we give it a high level directive that is to maximize the number of objects you can obtain, right? So we would tell mm -hmm. Voyager, your task is to maximize, right? The, the novel objects that you can obtain. And so what Voyager does is trying to meet that kind of unsupervised objective because we are not telling it that you need to find diamond or you need to find stone first before you need to find iron or you need to find iron before diamond we did not tell it that we just say you need to find as many novel objects as possible and we actually have a way to measure mm -hmm. it right we, we can look at its inventory and then count the number of diverse items it's able to obtain through its lifespan so we can actually quantitatively measure it and let me let me show you a figure here so we actually have like a comparison with some prior works is this one basically like uh this is like you know react uh, reflecting on some kind of uh baselines and all, all of gpt uh and this is voyager and this is voyager that the blue one is voyager without the skill library um and here for in this figure the x-axis is the number of prompting iterations and the y-axis is the number of distinct objects it's able to uncover or craft right it, it doesn't matter as long as you're in inventory, we see a new object, we, 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 we count it towards the progress. So it's got this high level objective programming to it. And um, mostly like the, 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 the skills, I would say a human will be able to do. Uh, and Voyager is not able to build crazy things yet because that would require vision. And in the original Voyager, we did not have computer vision, right? It's not doing the task from pixels. It's converting the world to text. And that will be a limitation. So if you want to build a castle, you, you, you got to see what you're building, right? Otherwise, it's really hard to kind of tell you the 3D coordinates and try to reason in your head. Even for humans, it's really hard. So Voyager doesn't do building tasks because we, we, we didn't ask it to. And also, it's not quite capable of because of the limitation of, the, of its perception module. To you, what is the strategic value of a corpus like YouTube, right, for training these type of... Uh, open-ended embodied agents like yeah. are these agents going to be able to make sense of the different rules of the world you know as they vary in simulations versus <clears throat> real world data physics for example varies drastically mm. so what is your thoughts so um i think the way to build foundation like one of the components to build foundation agent is really good video models that can understand not just minecraft video but maybe maybe videos from many different games or even videos of the of the real world 
of people doing like different tasks, right? We want to train on as many videos as possible because what videos encode is something that uh, we technically call intuitive physics. So, you, you know, like when, when, when humans, when all of us, right, go ahead to do our daily tasks, we don't solve physics equations in our head, right? Like if you kind of, uh, if you drop a cup on the floor, you, you, your, your brain cannot compute exactly where the water is going to spill or, you know, how the cup is going to be broken, right? You cannot simulate all of that. But you roughly know that you're going to make a mess. Like the water is going to spill and the cup, if it's a glass cup, it's mostly going to be broken. You have a, a rough common sense of where things are going. And that is the predictive model in our brain and what we call intuitive physics. It's not physics, it's intuitive, right? We cannot compute every trajectory. And I think for the current embodied agents, they lack this common sense. They don't, they, they can't really predict, you know, what's going on next. Uh, they don't have this, you know, intuitive physics built into their brain. And to learn intuitive, intuitive physics, I believe the best way is to learn on lots and lots of videos. And once you have that common sense model, it's still not enough, right? Like you, you can predict what's going on next, but you still don't know how to act. So just like if you watch, you know, tennis champions playing tennis, you can watch it all day and you know what's going to happen next. You have a predictive model in your brain, but can you play tennis as well as the best, you know, players, right? You still need a lot of practice to actually ground the common sense that you learn from the videos. And that's how I see the simulations come into play. So you need both the videos and a lot of pre-training and also the simulations, be it Minecraft or physics sim or some other games to really ground the knowledge through trial and error. And, and that's how I see, um, that's how I believe we should build the next embodied systems. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Is that how you see Omniverse fitting into all of this, right? Like Tesla's like noisy data at scale, but we're going to need sort of synthetic training data or like, you know, I guess open-ended agents trying stuff in the in simulated environments too. Yes. Um, how about this? L l let me share a screen. This is, uh, this is Eureka. Uh, it is a five-finger robot hand that's able to do pen spinning tricks in NVIDIA simulation. And how we are able to train this is actually using uh, something called uh, Isaac Sim that is built on top of Omniverse. So in terms of abstraction levels, you can think of Omniverse as like a base level graphics engine, right? It runs on the latest GPUs, it's able to get acceleration, hardware uh, native acceleration, and it does rendering physics and all of that. It's in Omniverse. And the Isaac Sim is a library built on top of Omniverse for robotics specifically. Um, so it's able to import things like robot hand models, import objects, you know, compute the contact physics of the fingers with the pen here. And most importantly, and probably the most uh, unique feature of Isaac Sim is, is its uh, scalability. So you can run 10,000 environments in parallel on a single GPU, which means you are basically speeding up reality by 10,000 X. Um, in, in the real world, you are bottlenecked by real physics, right? You, you, you simply cannot collect data uh, with this level of throughput. But in simulation, you can. If you throw a compute at it, and with you know, parallel computing, you can simulate 10,000 robot hands doing pen spinning at the same time. And in this way, you scale up the data stream, and you can train like very complex policies like pen spinning. That would otherwise take maybe a decade of real world time if you want to do this directly on a physical robot, right? It's very slow. Um, so yeah, that, that's how I see MDA simulation comes into play for embodied agents. And, and since we're talking about Eureka, I will just quickly cover this work. Um, so how is, how is Eureka trained? Um, basically, I see Eureka as two loops. The outer loop is a language model here at GPT-4 writing code in a physics simulation API. And this code will become the reward function. And reinforcement learning requires a reward function so that you have something to maximize, right? Something to work towards. And that is the second loop, the inner loop, is that given a reward function, we do reinforcement learning to train another neural network that controls the robot hand. And then this dual loop system is, is what makes Eureka quite unique. Um, you can think of this as system one and two thinking, right? From the book, Thinking Fast and Slow. The LOM loop, is a system two loop because it's doing high level reasoning, right? It's looking at how the hand uh, is performing and then proposing change in code. So it's like a system two deliberate slow reasoning. And the loop on the right is a system one loop. It is like fast, unconscious, like you don't do reasoning when you're, pan you're, 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 you're spinning pad, right? It's more like a feeling of it. It's, it's muscle memory. So the, the, the loop on the right-hand side will be the system one, where we have a smaller neural network, but it's much higher frequency. 
than, than the LLM and is able to control the hand to do very dexterous tasks. And uh, we are able to do not just uh, pen spinning, but like a few other kind of uh, manual manipulation tasks for the robot. Um, I, I'm not showing, I don't think I, I'm showing this here, but basically this method is general purpose and it's not limited to just pen spinning. Okay, and I'll open up for like five minutes of questions. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll try to make this quick. So I know you said, yeah. I think in the paper, it says that the reward functions can essentially be updated in somewhat real time. Is, is that correct? You don't have um, to retrain so the entire the, model. So for, for, the, for the reward function, like it's updated every time um, the inner loop or, or the loop on the right-hand side um, has finished. So right. you, you can think of like this loop as, as, a, as a full reinforcement learning training session, right? It, it, we train it to go to convergence and then it will have like a performance metric, which you can report back to GPT-4 and then GPT-4 will propose the next reward function. Okay. So, so the, the future that I'm seeing with this here is that we could, we could uh, have a, a bot that actually exists in the real world and we could potentially uh, with similar architecture, you know, uh, train a bot by actually showing it, you know, an example of and then, and then it practices practices that same example itself. So uh, I'm just I'm just wondering if you guys seem to be very focused on robotics. Um, so is this um, is this the future that you guys are, are looking towards? Yeah, um, I I think there are many ways we can scale Eureka even more, right? Like one is you know it scales as simulation scales, and here uh, we are learning like one skill at a time, right? This pen uh, pen spinning skill is like one Eureka run, um, but you can. Imagine that we, we can do maybe a thousand different skills in parallel if we throw a lot of GPUs at it. So that is something that we are uh, thinking about doing. Oh, and actually in this video, you can see like there are a lot of other tasks that we tried, but each task is like a separate neural network, right? Uh, we're not training a single one that has multitasking, but it is uh, an obvious next step that, 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 that we can do. Um, and the other thing is to actually make it work in the real world. And that will involve sim to real, right? How, how do we kind of uh, transfer the neural network learning simulation to the real world? And there are many techniques to it. One is called domain randomization, which is basically the simulation hypothesis I just mentioned. Like if you're able to master 10,000 different, you know, simulated realities or like different physical configurations in sim, let's say if you're able to uh, work with Earth's gravity and also Moon's gravity and also Mars gravity in simulation, um, 10,000 of them, then you are very likely able to generalize to the real world, which, you know, uh, will be very complex and not quite the same as the simulation, right? The simulation is always going to be um, inaccurate portrayal of the real world. But that's how we can overcome the same real gap. I feel like Eureka is a very underrated research paper for last year. It's probably my favorite. And <laughs> is it the first oh, of its thanks. kind? If, oh, sorry. Uh, if it, is it the first of its kind where LLM trained robot? Like, is it fully LLM trained robot? And if so, is there like a bridge being built right now where skill learned in Isaac Gym can be applied to real world robots? Yeah. Uh, so, first, uh, thanks for your kind words. Um, so, there are. Um, a few works on kind of combining LLMs and robotics. There are also some works from, you know, Berkeley, from Stanford, from some of the universities. Um, but I think Eureka, at least to my knowledge, should be the first on using LLM to kind of instruct how to train robot, right? You can see Eureka as automating the development of robotics, right? Because typically the reward functions are written by human engineers who's like, robot developers, robot engineers. And not like every developer can write reward function. It's actually very specific. You, you gotta have like domain expertise on how to use physics simulation. You gotta be familiar with the whole framework to be able to do it, right? It's not even easy for, for uh, any programmer to do this without training. Um, but here we found that GPT-4 is so good at zero shot and understanding documentation so we simply feed like NVIDIA's you know, physics API documentation to GPT-4, and then it writes these reward functions and you know, they can, it can actually write it better than the human developers. So we see Eureka as a first step towards automating the development of robotics itself, right? If you think of robotics, it's basically a bunch of code. Ultimately, it's just coding, right? Like can an entire robot stack be programmed not by us, but by GPT-4 or whatever is coming next, and then it can do it iteratively that is a fascinating question so uh so would it be reasonable to describe it as to a for the first ai agent trained robot in a simulation and the first kind of like lom instructed ai agent yeah the first lom okay. trained kind of uh like a whole AI agent, agent. Yeah. concept yeah 
And there is there a or, or like uh, for, for robotics? Yeah. So, sorry, go ahead. Is there like a possibility of uh, have you heard of Mamba, like the architecture oh, yeah, of Mamba? Yeah. Uh, is there a possibility yeah. of Transformer being replaced for Mamba in Roblox, uh, Robot Sims or Robot uh, Learning, like in Vima? Sorry, that, that might be off topic. Vima, yes. Um, I think it's an orthogonal question um, because uh, the architecture part, I mean, it, it will be useful, but it is not the, 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 the pain point of robot research. We have not even exhausted the potential of transformers yet. Okay, um, I think the hard part of for robotics is data, right? How do you get data for it? The data can come from internet videos, as we just covered. It can also come, can come from um, scaling up simulation. And for simulation, it's a little bit special because the data is generated by the agent itself, right? It's kind of an actively collected data versus internet will be passively connected data. Um, so data is the bottleneck. We can use whatever architecture we want. And if Mamba replaces transforming in the future, we're happy to switch. But it's not kind of the pain point right now. Got it. Thank you so much.